So yes, welcome uh, to this COVID-19 Known Unknowns webinar. I'm Fiona Godley, I'm Editor-in-Chief of the BMJ. And on behalf of the BMJ, the University of Bristol, the University of Newcastle, we're really pleased to see you with us. This is one of a series of webinars which stems from an editorial that was published in the BMJ on the 19th of October by George Davy Smith and Marcus Monafo, uh, which uh, had as its subtitle, uh, the more certain someone is about COVID-19, the less you should trust them. It reflected concerns about the polarization of debates and the hardening of positions on key issues, which were making it hard to make progress during the pandemic. And it called on us all to move away from certainty and, res and to respect uncertainty. It said acknowledging uncertainty a little more might improve not only the atmosphere of the debate and the science, but also public trust. And that's the spirit of this series of webinars. On November 20th, we had a full day's webinar, which was an overview of quite a few issues that have been confronting us during the pandemic. And that webinar is available on the BMJ's YouTube channel. And that's where this session will also be posted. Today's webinar is the second in a series of two hour webinars. The first was on schools. The next in two weeks time, February the 25th, will be on vaccines. This one, as I think you know, is on testing for SARS-CoV-2 in asymptomatic people. I want to thank Zoom for providing a license free for these COVID webinars. Uh, we have about 1500 of you registered to join from all around the world. And we're aiming to look at many aspects of this very complicated issue, testing as part of a program, the role of asymptomatic transmission, whether the tools are fit for the job, communicating and acting on the results of tests, and testing in a few different settings, workplaces, prisons, and the community. And we hope to have time for some panel discussion at the end. We've got some fabulous speakers. The timing is gonna be tight. Uh, we've got a lot to get through. So we're very lucky to have as our master of ceremonies, Dr. Phil Hammond. Over to you, Phil. Thank you very much, Fiona. And uh, hello, gorgeous, lovely BMJ webinar people. Uh, welcome uh, to our uh, webinar all about testing. A few bits of housekeeping. We welcome your questions. We very sadly can never get through all of them, uh, but there is a Q&A uh, uh, facility you'll see on the bottom right hand of your Zoom screen. Um, we need to know who you are when you answer a question and they will be chosen uh, by the panelists. So I'm sorry if we can't answer all of them. Uh, if you'd like to tweet, we'd also welcome that. The hashtag is hashtag COVID unknowns. Um, the most difficult thing I've found writing about the pandemic, and particularly the role of testing, is that we don't have a test for infectiousness. We have lots of tests from all over the place. We don't know how perfect they are, but as yet, no test of infectiousness, uh, which makes the debate all the more interesting. Uh, and we're going to kick off immediately. I'm delighted to welcome our first chair. Uh, the role is, what is the role of testing in the pandemic? And the rather wonderful Muir Gray will be chairing this session. So over to you, Muir. Where's he gone? Here I am. Excellent. Good to see you. How are you, Muir, by the way? You look lovely. Very well, thank you. Very well. Good to um, hear. Keep, keeping distant from others. <laughs> Good. So the, the first session, we are looking at this issue of testing populations. And our first speaker is Angela Raffle. And Angela and I have worked on screening for many years. And we published a book together on screening. And the first sentence was, all screening programs do harm like all healthcare does harm. Second, um, some programs do good as well as harm. Thirdly, some programs do more good than harm. And fourthly, some programs do more good than harm at reasonable cost. Angela's also a very good manager. She ran a very big program in the Southwest and a very big database. So she's one of the clearest thinkers and teachers about testing asymptomatic populations. So Angela, can we start with you, please? Thank you, Muir. Um, I'll just share my screen. Is that working? Tell me if it's not. I'll start my timer. My job is to share seven principles based on my long-term dedication to ensuring that all the mass testing we do is successful and valuable. First principle is focused on the highest risk groups. We want to find people who will transmit SARS-CoV-2 
And the most important place to look first are people with symptoms and their contacts. And on the left, I've depicted the testing intervention system for symptomatic people and contacts. It's still not working properly in England. It began as a classic public health program and then it got taken into a almost dissociated national thing which does more tests than many other countries but with not enough to show for it. Maybe as a distraction, maybe because testing everyone is such an intuitively attractive idea, maybe for commercial reasons, the UK government is keen to take us down the route of society-wide testing. This is like checking hundreds of taps for a leak when we haven't yet attended to the burst water main. Second, for treatments, we all know we have to look at evidence before we make a policy decision. The same must apply for testing programmes. And we owe a debt of gratitude to Liverpool colleagues for independently making their interim report available. But had things been left to the government, it appears that any, any evidence we do have tends to be left unpublished. We have to ask the right policy questions. Do symptomless people transmit and can we find them on testing? Isn't a very sound policy question. A stumbling block when you're testing symptomatic, symptomless people is always case definition. The human mind has a tendency to leap to assumptions. We say the test is positive and therefore this means that we know X, Y, or Z. But this extra phrase cannot be assumed. A case is defined in symptomless people as when we perform a test to this quality, we detect something at cutoff Z, and we still don't have uniform national reference standards. Fourth principle, you can't design a valuable system unless you're really clear what you're wanting to achieve. If we want to control the pandemic, the primary concern must be health outcomes, not photo opportunities for politicians, not profits for shareholders, not research empires. And we're used to summarizing test performance in a two by two table. Experience in screening says we look at the human beings. Symptomless people come because they want to be in the bottom right, be told that they're okay. It doesn't make a public health impact. The public health impact comes from the top left. And of those we pick up, symptomless viral material detected, in only some is transmission re reduced. Some, we're doing exemplary distancing anyway. Some aren't transmitters, some don't isolate. Fifth, it's a test, it's not a test, it's a program. We've learned this from decades of failure when all we did was offer tests. The early years of infant PKU and cervical screening brought no net benefit until they were organized into systematic high quality programs. All the necessary elements in place, all high quality, all working together well. Sometimes that last one is the most difficult. Some health systems don't do it as programs. They just offer tests. So when voices from the USA say, if we test everyone at home every week, we won't even need a vaccination program. We need to be aware of the context that comes from. Six, the humans in the system behave in many ways and how we give them clear, clean information is crucially important. On the left, standard national letter for negative bowel screening. Nowhere makes up their own. It's done once and shared, very careful. Your result shows no, no further test needed at this time. On the right is sales talk. This will give you total peace of mind. That has all kinds of damaging, confusing consequences. Number seven. When Muir started changing the mess that was cervical screening and then all the other programs into something fit for purpose and something to be proud of, he changed the culture to honesty, trust, cooperation, kindness, learning and goodwill. And he enabled us to create robust processes for assembling evidence and informing decision takers that were as resistant as possible to commercial manipulation. So that's my summary. None of this is easy. I'm not saying it's easy. We're in for the long haul, but this is what we need. Thank you.
Great, thank you very much. And our next speaker is Shan Taylor Phillips. And Shan has also worked, well, we did at one time try to drop the word screening because the word screen means something like the thing you're looking at at the moment with no holes in it. The original meaning of the word screen was a sieve. And sieve screens is used in that way only for combine harvesters and sorting out gravel at the side of motorways when they talk about screening with big sieves. So the word screening itself gave a sense of false reassurance. And Shan has published extensively, not only on these risk management programs, formerly called screening, but also on the methods and the gathering of evidence. So Shan Taylor Phillips from University of Warwick is our next speaker. Shan, please. Thank you very much. Uh, just share my screen. Okay, um, so I'm going to talk about screening asymptomatic people and um, what the role of that is um, in addition to testing symptomatic people. Okay, so my expertise is in evaluating screening programs. That's the perspective I take, but I speak entirely on behalf of myself today, not an organisation. So the basic questions we ask are, um, what are we already doing? What does screening add on top of that? What are we aiming to achieve by that? And what evidence is there for the benefits and harms and costs? So we're already doing test and trace PCR for symptomatic people. Um, here we're thinking about adding community mass testing, targeting asymptomatic people using a lateral flow test. And, and everyone's aiming to reduce transmission of SARS-CoV-2 and the associated hospitalization and um, death. So what are we already doing? The, um, test and trace at the moment is not detecting large numbers of symptomatic people. So bits of evidence on this, the UCL social study suggests that people um, with symptoms, about half of them aren't actually requesting tests. Uh, the, um, REACT study suggests that the four symptoms that we currently are listing eligible for a test actually only covers half of symptomatic individuals. And if you compare the number of um, people detected by test and trace to um, population surveys like REACT weighted prevalence, you find that we are missing a large number of symptomatic cases at the moment. And that matters because symptomatic people are more likely to infect others than asymptomatic people. There's also um, potential for improvement in tracing of contacts and adherence to self-isolation. So the biggest opportunity is clearly in focusing on improving what we deliver for symptomatic people. So asymptomatic people, what does it add? So if, if um, if we detect infectious asymptomatic people with SARS-CoV-2 and they isolate, then we decrease transmission. And that's what we're trying to do. However, if we give more people false negative results, and there are some issues with sensitivity of tests, um, and that they then have more risky behavior, that increases transmission. And if symptomatic people decide to take the quicker lateral flow test in the community rather than attending test and trace, that increases transmission because the um, lateral flow test is less sensitive. And what we've done is um, myself, Alice Sitch um, and Angela Raffle have made a shiny app, which is just to demonstrate these sort of dependencies. So this is it, and I won't talk you through the whole thing, but basically it's a flow chart of um, the different types of testing, on the left in blue, test and trace. On the right in yellow, community mass testing. And then in green are the benefits of the um, testing and screening. And in red, the harms. And top left is just sort of the overall summed up. And it's to, to show the mechanisms. And we allow um, the assumptions to be changed in the app. And that's because um, the evidence really is, isn't there and people disagree on this. So here's an example. This is um, using my standard assumptions um, and we're talking about test and trace only now. 
And this is the outcomes box. And if 23% of symptomatic people are attending test, test and trace, you can see in the top left box, we're estimating that means in a population of a million, that's, um, that results in 1,405 symptomatic transmitters reducing their risk. Now, if you change that assumption and say, actually 50% of symptomatic people now attending test and trace, you improve that, you can see on the right that the benefits in the green boxes increase massively. Um, and, and that's because you're really focusing on the people that are transmitting. Now, this is the box on the left here is the same. It, um, so this is test and trace on the same assumptions. But now the box on the right is adding community mass testing. And you can see the top left box hasn't changed because community mass testing is about asymptomatic people. The second green box down, you can see a small number of asymptomatic um, transmitters reduce their risk. Um, and that's a, a low yield from a very large number of tests. And what's interesting is if um, lots of symptomatic people who wouldn't have gone to test and trace go to community mass testing, it becomes much more effective. Uh, but if symptomatic people are diverted from test and trace to mass testing, then it, it actually, the harms increase. So, the impact of community mass testing is very dependent on the behavior of people and particularly symptomatic people. So what do we know? There's huge opportunities um, remain in, in improving testing for symptomatic people. Community mass testing will stop some people from transmitting, but it could in increase transmission from some other people. We can reduce that harm by clearly communicating that testing negative doesn't mean you're safe. And what don't we know? We haven't actually got um, much empirical evidence on what is the impact of adding community mass testing on transmission. And there's a massive opportunity for collaboration to create more evidence. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sharon. Well, thank you very much, Sharon. Well, very powerful that diagram and that these resources will all be made available. Um, so our third speaker is Brian McCloskey and Brian's uh, good experience in many different countries. Uh, so we'll be bringing a different perspective and also works for an organization that's a very clear thinking organization called Chatham House. So Brian, over to you. Thanks for and good afternoon. I can just get my... I just want quickly to follow through on the same theme, um, looking at what might be the problem with mass testing. And part of it is around the problem may be that we don't know what the problem really is. So just my standard declaration of no interests. Uh, just to fill in a bit about me, I was a local director of public health for a long time. I got involved in global health work. But recently I've been involved in international outbreak issues from um, Ebola through MERS with WHO uh, and most recently WHO and coronavirus. And I think part of the problem about how we've got to where we are is that to an extent there's been two parallel conversations going on. Some people raising questions about the risks of testing for negatives and people replying by talking about the benefits of testing for asymptomatic positives. And it's important to realize that testing for positives and testing for negatives are fundamentally different concepts and they require different approaches and different tests. And testing people without symptoms brings a different dynamic to the debate as Shan and Angela have highlighted. And then remember that testing does not stop transmission. Testing followed by appropriate action does. And we haven't fully defined in some of these programs what it is we're trying to do. And we need to think about it properly as a holistic public health program. But it's also important to remember that we can't afford to ignore the realities of outbreak control. In this case, most transmission is from symptomatic people. That's where the maximum benefit is from tackling the problem. But I find it interesting sitting in the UK to think, you know, if you look at Ebola in West Africa, or more recently Ebola in the Democratic Republic of the Congo, when it arises, 
The first thing the Ministry of Health does is set up a contact tracing test and trace system. And from day one, their target is to identify 100% of contacts and make sure they're isolated and looked after. And in the DRC, one of the poorest countries in Africa, in one of the most remote parts of that country, in an area where there are at least five armed conflict groups shooting at you as you do the response, the target from day one is 100% and they agonize over every contact lost to follow up. Whereas in the UK, we seem to be happy to accept something between 40 or 60% of contacts identified. And that begs the question as to why in the UK we think we are beyond WHO guidance and why we think we cannot learn from countries like Africa. So two questions for me are, which is the bigger failure in the UK? Missing asymptomatic cases are not testing and tracing the known cases. Which is the bigger gap in the UK? The ability to test or having a proper local public health workforce to track and trace and take the actions that are necessary after testing. So we know some of the challenges about testing. No test is completely reliable. We get false positives and false negatives. We have situations where the action is not taken after a positive test or the wrong action is taken after a negative test. But more importantly, it comes back to the resources to follow up because as we said, testing does not do anything in itself. It's the action after a test result that makes a difference. And if we don't have the public health resource to do that, then the testing program will not be successful. And a big issue we've seen from Liverpool and, and other places, those who can't afford to self-isolate won't come for testing and therefore the action isn't taken. So I think it's probably unlikely that a well-organized program to test for positive will result in net harm compared to no testing. But we actually have to evaluate that to be sure we're doing it right, especially for people without symptoms. And we do appreciate the fact that the Liverpool pilot has given us a lot of information about that. However, I also think that it is more likely that even a well-organized program to test for negatives, such as the test to release, test to protect, test to enable, will result in net harm compared to no testing at all. And as such, that requires very careful assessment before proceeding. So we need to move on and look at what might be the right role for mass or smart testing in the COVID response, and do that in the context of good public health principles and also in the context of what we can learn from other countries. It's not about saying mass testing is inherently wrong. It's definitely not about criticizing the Liberal pilot. It was done very well in a very short space of time, and we've learned a lot from it. And there clearly is a role for wide community testing as part of the COVID response. But testing people without symptoms brings this different dynamic, and it requires us to consider the principles established for screening that we've heard about already. And testing people without local resources to track and trace will not stop transmission. And as I've said, testing for positive and testing for negatives are different concepts that need different approaches and different tests. And in this point, I think I would disagree with the Liberal group and to the extent that I don't think it's easy to segue from a program that was designed to do mass community testing to detect cases and make them isolate into a program that looks at the test to enable and test to protect issues of negative testing. Because I think they're so fund fundamentally different, they should be dealt with differently in different programs, probably running in parallel, but we come back to saying, be clear about what the issue is that you're trying to talk about, what you're trying to solve, be clear about the outcomes you want, and that will help you get the program right in the first place. Thank you. Mia, yeah, you're on mute. Sorry. So it's uh, 28 minutes past four. So um, some questions from the audience or any comments? These, now, these will be made available on the BMJ website. Is that right? Did you say, Fiona, the presentation? Um, yes, the, the, um, the, the webinar will be available on the BMJ's YouTube channel. The presentations won't be made available separately, but they're there on the YouTube channel. There, there, there have been some... I mean, I think uh, Angela's two by two box and then the big table um, from Shans. And then I think uh, Brian's challenges 
uh, PowerPoint. So perhaps we could think about that as we go through. There are some some distillations that I think would be very helpful for people yeah. to have. And Muir Nikki is able to ask questions if you wanted to ask her to. Sure. Um, Sorry, I think you... we've got. I think we've got time for one audience question. So yeah. um, does the panel view asymptomatic testing for COVID as screening or case finding? And how would they differentiate between the two? Angela? What matters is that you have your evidence, you make good decisions, you design a good programme and you deliver it to a high quality with good information. Um, the semantics of what you label that programme as are secondary. Yep. There's a, uh, Sean, how do you, um, case, yeah. finding, case finding is a backdoor way for getting screening in, isn't it? Atrial fibrillation case finding. Yeah, I mean, to me, it's definitely screening. You know, you're inviting people without symptoms who don't think they've got the disease. You're systematically inviting them for a test to see if they have got the disease. The way it differs from the screening we're used to is a lot of the benefit is not for the person who came for the test, but for transmission to others. So that is um, a, a way it does differ from what we're used to, but all of the principles of screening apply in exactly the same way. Brian? I think I'll go with Angela in the sense that I, I, don't, I don't really care what we call it, but if you take people who don't know they've anything wrong with them and do a test to find something, then this, the principles of a screening program have to be have to apply, and we have to do it with clear objectives, clear quality assurance, clear governance, and good, clear public information and public engagement. Yeah, for me, case finding is disorganized testing, screening by the back door. So it's a covert approach to reducing things. Um, so thank you very much to our three speakers. So I think the conclusion is that we, although without saying that the screening is the right, the National Screening Committee does things right. There is a discipline for addressing these issues when you start to interfere in the lives of asymptomatic people. Thank you very much. On to the next section, please. Thanks very much, uh, Muir, and thank you to uh, Angela Sharn and Brian for that. Uh, don't forget that you can tweet about this session on uh, COVID unknowns, hashtag COVID unknowns, uh, and also keep asking us questions on the Q&A function. Uh, now, before you start doing asymptomatic screening, you need to understand the role of asymptomatic transmission, which leads us nicely into the next session, chaired by George Davy-Smith. Over to you, George. Uh, thanks, Phil. So in this uh, session, we have uh, one talk from uh, Nicola Lowe, uh, who's an epidemiologist at the University of Bern, and uh, she's going to uh, talk to us uh, about uh, asymptomaticity. Now, um, for epidemiologists, the standard answer before 2020 to any question was that it's more complicated than that. Whatever's said, epidemiologists complicate it. And uh, as being asymptomatic sounds like a straightforward uh, concept, but uh, Nicola is going to uh, have the um, traditional epi epidemiologist's role of telling us that it's not quite as simple as it sounds. Thank you very much, George. How did you know? Uh, Nikki is going to advance my slides for me. So I just want to uh, say that I'm giving this talk uh, on behalf of both me and Muge Cevic, who was uh, supposed to be talking to you, but can't be here today. So next slide, please. So it's my personal view, and fortunately that of uh, Muge and our uh, colleagues in Canada and the US, that to understand the role of uh, uh, asymptomatic SARS-CoV-2, we actually need to work towards having an accurate and a systematic characterization of what it actually is. Next slide, please. So in my view, there are three components to this. The first is how common is asymptomatic SARS-CoV-2? The second is how infectious is it? And the third is how much does it actually contribute to overall transmission? And before we can answer any of those questions, we need to understand actually what we mean when we say asymptomatic. I just want to draw your attention to the fact that this is absolutely not the policy question that Angela says that we all need to answer. This is the academic question about whether symptomless people transmit infection. So next slide, please. Now, what is uh, 
the claim that got me going uh, about uh, asymptomatic infection was actually this lovely article, news article in the BMJ, claiming that four fifths of uh, cases are asymptomatic uh, with data from China. Uh, and this claim has been used to imply that the death rate from COVID is much lower than we think that it is because undetected people have somehow been left out of the denominator. Uh, and I'll explain why that uh, isn't true. But along the same lines, we have uh, articles about misleading arithmetic, uh, minimizing the impact of the pandemic because of the claim that asymptomatic transmission never occurs. Uh, and as we know in medicine, there are no nevers, so we can discount that one immediately, but I will come back to it actually. But these things do, of course, make asymptomatic infection uh, uncertain. And in addition to the uh, claims, uh, I want to say something about definitions, study con um, design and context. context. So on to the next slide. We need to understand what our picture is of when we're thinking of who's asymptomatic. And of course, if you become infected with SARS-CoV-2, everyone is asymptomatic at the very beginning of infection until they either develop symptoms. That means that in fact, they are pre-symptomatic unless they're someone who is actually going to remain asymptomatic throughout the whole course of their infection. And there are people like that as well. Now, what we have to uh, realize is when we start looking at the study designs for measuring this, is that you cannot measure, uh, can you go on to the next slide please? At a single point of time, you can't distinguish between someone who is pre-symptomatic and someone who is going to remain asymptomatic. So that means if you have a cross-sectional study that at a single point in time says four fifths of people are asymptomatic as this uh, start this news item in the BMJ did. That does not mean that four fifths of people are truly asymptomatic. It's mixing in the ones who would have developed symptoms. If you want to know how many are going to be truly asymptomatic throughout the course of their infection, you've got to follow them up for long enough to develop symptoms if they were going to. And that usually means a, a full incubation period. So now that we know that how you need to measure uh, truly asymptomatic infection, let's move on and ask what it means in terms of the definition of who is asymptomatic. On the right hand side, there are three uh, panels showing that who counts as being asymptomatic has actually changed over time. Not really, but in terms of how we've measured it. Obviously in January, 2020, there was this pneumonia that had some symptoms as associated with uh, respiratory infections. So studies done really early on in the, in the uh, pandemic would have defined a larger number of people as being asymptomatic because they just didn't um, have uh, know what the full spectrum of symptoms was. So we had then in March 2020, this recognition of a much wider spectrum of symptoms, including anosmia. Uh, and then by September 2020, we've got uh, definitions that include long, long lists of any of those symptoms. So the chances of being called asymptomatic by September of, la of last year were much, much smaller than at the beginning. And that just depends on the time at which the study was done. Another thing that makes a difference is what kind of study you do and recognizing that uh, being asymptomatic, well, being symptomatic is a really non-specific definition. This is a respiratory illness. So loads of people have respiratory symptoms uh, all the time. And what this picture is showing you is, a, is from a sero seroprevalence study that was done in Geneva it's showing the odds ratio. So that's the comparison of who is seropositive, the odds of being seropositive, depending on whether you report symptoms or not. And I've put a box around the, um, the bars for the children or un the under 18 year olds, showing that basically for any of the symptoms that we associate with uh, COVID, if you're a child, they're really, really poor at distinguish distinguishing whether you're actually infected or not. 
And if you're asymptomatic, the odds of uh, being a um, of being seropositive, if you're asymptomatic, are actually quite uh, um, strong if you are an adult. But again, for children, it doesn't really uh, distinguish very well. This brings up a caution about serological studies for establishing asymptomatic infection. There is a lot of problem with recall bias and then asking someone if they've actually had these symptoms. Many, many people will have had these symptoms uh, and whether they're seropositive or not uh, is, is just um, doesn't really, really uh, address the issue. And these studies tend to have a lot of bias, recall bias and suffer from the non-specificity of the symptoms. So next slide, please. Let's move on and try and address uh, the, these three questions about the role of asymptomatic transmission. The first one is what's the proportion of truly asymptomatic infections? And here I have picked out four uh, reviews that have been published as systematic reviews. And the top three truly used systematic methods to um, assess this and tried to uh, take into account the, the potential risks of bias in assessing uh, symptom, um, what was asymptomatic infection. What you can find, what you can see from those studies is that the point estimates range from say, so 10 to 30%. So in the middle of you sort of uh, condense that a bit, let's say 15 to 30% of people with truly asymptomatic infection uh, in a large number of studies, and particularly in the ones uh, by Bayan Basuran and in the uh, Buitrago Garcia review, which is our review, uh, which choose subsets where the risk of selection bias is less because they don't depend on you being uh, on your risk of being uh, infected when you're selected into the study. So those tend to have the lower uh, um, estimates of the true portion of proportion of asymptomatic infections. The review at the bottom by uh, Oren and Topol uh, is claimed to be a systematic review, but actually doesn't isn't reported in a way that makes it uh, reproducible. And their summary of at least a third, there's no quantitative synthesis of those results, is a summary from two serological studies. Uh, and as I've said, those um, studies are, are subject to uh, recall bias and other biases. So next, please. Let's think about how infectious is asymptomatic SARS-CoV-2. Now, the way to, that we do that in uh, empirical studies is to see from an index case who they've transmitted it to. And that quantity, that proportion out of all of the potential contacts is called the secondary attack rate. There are lots of that systematic reviews of secondary attack rate. Uh, I've put some of the ones, some on the right hand side. And those, the two at the bottom, have taken all of studies, uh, depending on whether the index case was defined as asymptomatic or presymptomatic and symptomatic, and worked out proportions. They come out with very low proportions of uh, secondary attack rate for asymptomatic people. But I think a fairer comparison is if you actually use this, an internal comparison of the study has measured both uh, asymptomatic secondary attack rate and symptomatic. That's what we did in our systematic review. And we come out with an estimate that about people who are truly asymptomatic are about a third as infectious as uh, symptomatic people. And people who are pre-symptomatic uh, are much, much more similar in their infectiousness because in fact, they're pre-symptomatic. They're gonna become symptomatic and transmit. Next slide, please. One study that has come out strongly, which was the study in which that claim that people are, who are asymptomatic never transmit, was a study from China based on a mass testing uh, program. And the trouble with this study was that it was done at a period when basically there was no one left. It was done in Wuhan. They screened nearly 10 million people. It was basically done when no one was, who was left, who was detected, was actually still in their symptomatic period. They didn't culture virus from anyone. They didn't, so they didn't find any secondary infections and they found 300 asymptomatic people, but they could not establish that any of them, those were actually infectious. And their presumption is that they were at the very, very tail end of their infection. And I confirmed that today with uh, Professor Max Bachmann, who used to be at Bristol University, his pictures up above. So next slide, please. 
Uh, the, I'm not going to dwell on this, the proportion of pre-symptomatic people you cannot basically find from empirical studies. It just simply depends on when you do the study, uh, in what circumstances you do the study. So the next slide, please. If we want to know what the true fraction of uh, transmission is caused by everyone who's asymptomatic and pre-symptomatic, uh, and this feeds into sort of the, the whole transmission of what goes on in our pandemic, we need to do that from uh, transmission dynamic models. We reviewed the results of these uh, in our review. You can also say the results here are all over the place, but and it's dependent on model structure and the assumptions that they make. But in most of these studies, their point estimate, their central estimate for the amount of transmission is that more than 50% of transmission overall is caused by people who don't have any symptoms um, at the time. So last, I, um, I think this is going on, next slide, last slide, um, is that what we need to uh, really understand and take into consideration is that types of evidence have changed over time, definitions have changed over time, and the, the um, types of studies have changed over time. We can't use cross-sectional studies to assess the proportion of asymptomatics, and serological studies are difficult to interpret. I've put up a summaries of our best estimates from our uh, hours and other systematic reviews. And in terms of mass screening, essentially this doesn't really matter unless with asymptomatic infections, uh, it means that the tests were less, work less well and that's a, uh, an issue that's going to be dealt with. But my last point is really that context is everything. You have to take the context of the study and when and where it was done, what definitions it's used. Can you just go on to the last, very last slide, which is uh, the acknowledgements that I like to, to make to all of the team of people that have been working with uh, in Bern um, Muge and colleagues and funding from uh, our sources from the EU and Switzerland. Thanks very much. Great. Uh, that's great, thanks. I think in the interest of time, we'll move uh, straight on to, uh, to the next uh, session, uh, which is chaired by Sheila Bird. And, we, and if we keep to time, we'll have 15 minutes at the end for uh, qu uh, questions uh, on these and other points. Thanks. Okay, thank you, George. Let's go straight to Sheila then. And uh, she's talking about asymptomatic testing. Are tools fit for the job? Uh, Sheila. Exactly. Um, I'm pleased to say that this session has got three professors from different disciplines. John Deeks, biostatistician, Kim Peter, infectious diseases, and Patrick um, Bossu, from, who is a clinical epidemiologist. And so without further ado, may I invite John to give his talk. Thank you, Sheila. Um, hopefully my screen is being shared. Um, I'm going to be talking about the evidence uh, about the relationship of um, uh, lateral flow tests and infectiousness, which is a key part of um, the arguments for doing asymptomatic uh, testing. Um, it's about the number 25, which we'll come to in a second. Um, I'm declaring my uh, interest related to all of the Cochrane work we've been doing on tests and the work from the Royal Statistical Society um, and a few other little bits on the bottom of the slide. I'm going to tell you about eight studies and I'm going to try and do that in eight minutes. So obviously it's going to be a bit of a pace and I apologize for the lack of detail, but I'm going to try and give you some of the evidence on this question about um, uh, uh, these relationships. Um, but first, I'm going to start with one of um, a figure from uh, Muge Cevic, which is uh, a very useful figure to explain how during the infection period, we see people's viral levels uh, rise to a peak and then fall down. And in this period, there's a part in the middle where we have a window of infectiousness. Um, and uh, it, sometimes it's being described by there being cultural, cultural virus during this time. So in this window here where people could infect others, uh, part of the, what we're looking at is have, have we shown that studies can culture virus? And um, above that line, when the viral load is high enough, we're going to be saying they're infectious or non-infectious. That's one way in which this, pro this has been tackled. So the key thing is that if we could find a number on this line, uh, which puts us in this window, that would help us perhaps think about whether um, we can identify people who are infectious or not. And that's where we're going to get to this number 25. So um, this is uh, minutes from SAGE at the 17th of December when they were talking about this. 
And uh, clearly they're saying that expert opinion and evidence is suggesting that 25 is a number, a CT number. So this is the number of um, iterations of the PCR process, which needs to be done before somebody is detected. So if they're detected before that, it means they have high virus and this is assumed to be viable transmission. This number also links to <clears throat> evidence from looking at the Innova test. So first of all, this is a study from Porton and uh, and down a laboratory based study trying to establish the lower limit of detection for the Innova test. And you can see here that that was around 9, um, 25, a CT value of 25. And then these are data from real world use of the Innova test in Liverpool, where you can see from these figures I've just added that the sensitivities of the test that actually um, the CT value of 25 nicely divides these into a, where the test doesn't work at all well compared to where it works a bit or quite a bit. So that number is gonna be 25. That's the argument we're thinking. And what we've also seen that if this is all true, this works very nicely because it looks like the Innova test is gonna be positive in this window of infectiousness and negative. And this is the argument which is being used to talk about this test as being a test of infectiousness, uh, which has been used quite a lot. Let's look then at these four studies. And there are two studies. I'm gonna start with the first two, which are looking at how um, the uh, ability to culture virus depends on the CT value. So this is a, a study from Collindale. Uh, it's a study of both symptomatic and asymptomatic people. And the graph on the right shows the results of doing this and the percentage of the cases who could be cultured. And you can see it drops down as the CT value goes up. So you always have to remember high CT values means the PCR machine um, had to go through a lot of cycles. So it means low viral load. So on nearly all the graphs, right hand side of the graph means low viral load left-hand side means high viral load. There's one exception I'll point out. So if you drop the CT equals 25 line down here, you can see surely to the left, we've got high rates of viral, uh, viable virus detected. But the right-hand side, there's still quite a lot. It's not nearly as much, but 34% isn't a negligible amount of cases which you might think could, uh, we could culture virus from. And you can see there were positive cases uh, counted all the way down to beyond um, CT values of 35 here. Not very many, but they're there. So uh, it's not a step change, it's a curve here. And this is a, um, a larger data set, a slightly more busy graph, similar study. Uh, this is from France, from Marseille, so the Regional Reference Lab for Southeast France, likely mainly symptomatic people. And I've highlighted in yellow that the important line on this graph, which you can see is a, a clearly descending line, but there are no steps again. And the 25 value divided left and right, um, the 85% culture, that's exactly the same percentage as, as from the PHE study, 24% on the right-hand side. So again, Again, a quarter could be cultured below that line. The next two studies are actually looking at can we identify people who um, transmit the virus to others. So there were two studies um, uh, which were around about this. This is the one published just last week, and it's a trial done of Catalonia. And in this trial, they uh, tested the contacts of the recruited and treated cases at 14 um, days and at baseline. And so they classified them then according to the CT value of the index case. Um, this graph is the one which is the other way around because it's plotted it using the, the viral load measurements rather than the CT values. But I've drawn the line on which fits with this. We'll explain why that's the point shortly. But on the right hand side now we have the high viral load. Detection secondary attack rate was 20% amongst those contacts in that group. And to the left it's less than seven, it's 25. The, the, the attack rate's 13%. So it hasn't even halved when you've gone below 25. And the final one, this is Tim's study. Uh, he'll be talking about it with a lot more detail afterwards. Um, but this is done in the, in the UK track um, test and trace data, a, a very large data set he and his colleagues have worked through. I've had to here extract, um, uh, extrapolate from the graphs to get the numbers. But in this case here, um, he noted that the, 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 uh, the relationships are different for different groups of exposure. So, when you add all of those together, uh, I've estimated that the inf secondary infection rate is 7.4 uh, for higher viral loads above, uh, below 25 and 3.4 above. So again, it's about halving. It's about the same magnitude of effect as we, we see. But here, the uh, secondary attack rates are very much lower, probably re um, reflecting the, the incompleteness of the, of the, of the tracing in, um, in the UK system. 
Uh, we have to be very careful, though, with CT values because um, every machine gives a different CT value for the same sample and would see different things on different days and so on like that. There's non-comparability of them. Uh, there have been experiments done to try and relate them to viral load. And the left hand side is the, there's the plot from the Catalonia study. But you can see here on this graph, when you plot the results from these three different studies, there's a thousand fold difference in the number of viral particles uh, between them. So CT values on their own actually are not stable things. Uh, finally, let's just check what models have done because our policymakers are using models for decision making. How have they actually simulated this re relationship with infectiousness? So this graph at the moment is showing um, the data from Tim Pito's uh, household contacts group for reference. So this is the empirical data from his nice curve. If we look maybe at two studies, so um, the um, Quilty study is, is one which is linked to the current government website uh, looking at test to release policies. And in that study, it's got a, um, a, a, a line which is constant with a drop at 30. So no risk after 30. Uh, the second one is more concerning. I think the first one is not an unreasonable approximation is from uh, Larry Moore and Miner's study, which is the one which has told us that we shouldn't um, be worried about having low sensitivity tests. Now, in that simulation study, there is no risk of anybody transmitting virus at CD values above 22. So it's not surprising, uh, if you think about it, that they don't think that actually having um, a, a high sensitivity test is worthwhile. There's no chance of getting an infected cases um, in those values. So to sum up, the knowns, infectiousness, it's not a binary thing. It's a continuum across all CT values. Uh, there are no magic numbers. Uh, many epidemiologists would think, well, why on earth would we think there would be? And what we're seeing is that the viral culture rates and the secondary infection rates are reasonably high at these values of CT values above 25. And therefore, we can't really be talking about tests of infectiousness. And we should be looking at, at stopping this language because I think it's giving the wrong message. We really urgently need to find better tests than Innova, ones which are more sensitive. It's really important to get sensitive lateral flow tests. They will be the future for us, but not the ones that we've got now. The unknowns, all of this data is on PCR. It's not on lateral flow tests. It's been extrapolated. Distributions of viral loads are going to be different in asymptomatics. Most of this data is from symptomatics. Somebody will get a Nobel Prize one day for working out how to convert CT values between different machines. And we really need to have a lot of scrutiny of our models to see what functions of infectiousness they're based upon to see whether they should be trusted. Sorry, I've been a bit too long. Excellent, thank you very much. Now we'll go on to uh, hear from Tim Pito, please. Oh, what's happened there? Tim, are you with us? Yeah, I want to say this as oh, possible. Can you let me say the screen? Your screen? I seem to. I, I can't say the screen. Oh, that's better. Okay, so this Excellent. is. Excellent. Please go ahead, Tim. A lot of things have already been said, so I'm, I will skip the ones that have been said. Um, um, basically, just to remind people, Normally, you do things evidence beyond reasonable doubt. I'm certain you agree with things that pose you no harm. In a pandemic situation, you have no time to get the right evidence. So you've got to do it on the evidence of balance of probability. You can't be purist about this because people have to make decisions now about what to do for the best. And I'm just pointing that out because we can't expect perfect things. The other things I will all say, we are trying to look for infectiousness. We all know that. And the other thing I want to point out to you at the moment, what we're doing is we are trying to quarantine people we believe are infectious. And we're doing this without much evidence. So the evidence for social distancing, face masks, all that stuff is done on the balance of probability, about two meter rule, no evidence. Oh, some evidence, but not beyond reasonable doubt. Face masks, controversial, and so on. Now, we quarantine people or isolate people for different reasons and guilty by association and if you talk about quarantine days to prevent the transmission you need to get guesstimates i'm not saying that the orders of magnitude guesstimates that actually we are quarantining people with low risk of future transmission and the promise is that lateral flow antigen testing if positive might be quite good at picking up people who are infectious that's the promise um we've talked about pcr status being pcr um test not being very good 
and there's a danger that people think it is the disease and people believe it's the disease, it's not the disease. So when you, when you talk about sensitivity of a new test against PCR, it's rather misleading. And the disadvantages of PCR, I think, we mentioned, the one important thing is the slow turnaround time in, in, in terms of the incubation period of the illness. So if you, and so if you want to get an outbreak, and detect an outbreak, then um, PCR tests are very bad at finding a new outbreak. You want an immediate turnaround time. And all the modeling says quick turnaround times makes a huge difference. And we talk, it's a foot. If you are positive PCR, it's already been said, you may well not be infectious. 50, a big false positive rate. If you get a positive PCR, it might be not infectious. And we, PCRs can give you false positives because of lab contamination, not talked about, but quite common. And um, Don Dix has talked about the fact that CTs are not very good to understand. We all know about lateral flow device. One thing which you ought to know about them based on monoclonal antibodies, and in principle, the third generation lateral flow tests will end up being very specific and sensitive because monoclonals are very good. It may not be good for the first generation ones. I'm not going to oversell it. Um, okay, the portent guys, we help the portent guys to think about it. I'm completely independent. I don't get any money from anybody. I get paid by the NHS. Um, there's, we've looked at 80 kits and about 16 now have come through and they virtually all are quite specific. The false positive rate is really quite low. Um, I think you've seen this before. And the only thing I want to point out, remind people that um, if you've got a low barrel load, you do not pick up very many positives. John's mentioned that. And the only reason for saying that is because um, if you, if you screen people who at the end of their illness, then they will not be positive at the end of the epidemic. And you can easily, and we, no one's claiming that they're going to be positive. Now, um, I think I'll leave this out because we, I want to go on about the infectiousness. And in case people aren't used to it, this is, somebody mentioned in their um, question, this is daily at one person, first person I've known to do this, Every day they did a test, healthcare worker, and you can see the first test was negative, weak positive, and strong positive in the middle. And after by day 10, it goes negative again. And that gives you some idea of how it works. And in the middle, it goes up positive very quickly. And it is semi-quantitative, in fact. Um, so we did, we wanted to measure infectiousness directly, not by viral culture, but directly using test and trace data, 40,000 contact case pairs, and we, we've got an updated now information we're just studying on a new lot with a new virus. And it's all adjusted by demography and types of contact. The main limitation about this is we did not make any allowance for possible third party transmission. We might be able to do that in the next iteration. So it'll overcall infectiousness in that sense. And you've seen these graphs before. What I want you to realize is that we are looking at a particular distribution of viral loads in the people going past the um, test and trace center, a, a reasonable percentage of those people had no symptoms. They go to test and trace with no symptoms. There's no difference in the answers between symptomatic and um, asymptomatic patients. And I just want to go through this a little bit, one second a bit longer. And that is, this is a distribution of people. If, if you go to a large gathering and get um, a COVID, the question is, who is giving you that COVID infection? What is their viral load? Um, the donor who's likely to give you the infection. And although the very, very high viral loads are very likely to give you infection, there are not very many of them. But the oranges and the light or yellows are the most likely people to give you infection. And they're the ones with viral, with viral loads above 10,000. I've got some CTs there on the thermo efficient ones. The light blues, with the low CTs are, un, are not unlikely to be the one giving it to you because of their numbers and because um, they're not very infectious. And I only say that because to some extent, if we can pick up those, we do very well. And I can show you using four different kits in this picture, how many we pick up. So we pick up all the dark oranges and the, most of the yellows, we miss the blues. 
the kits miss the blues. And the question is how, how much infection are the blues really responsible for? Is that an artifact or true? And we went on and we now done it on 16 kits all together. And this is a picture setting up. I haven't labeled the brand names, but I'm not certain whether the manufacturers would want me to at this stage. But that's Innova. This is the proportion of hit positives in the set of 200 samples that we're looking at. About 55% in that sample of 200 were positive. And this is the predicted number of transmission events that would be averted by using it. It was about 88% in this particular set. And these are the different set kits we've got. And what's interesting to me is that the predicting how good they are is quite difficult from looking at how what proportion of the 200 samples were positive. The other thing I would like to say is the idea about symptomatic versus asymptomatic. Um, we have, I don't understand, I'm a practicing clinician and I don't understand the, that it's so easy to distinguish between symptomatic and asymptomatic people. If you've got a slight snuffly nose, some people call it symptomatic and some not. Are you really going to go to a test and trace center with just some slight snuffle nose? I'm not certain, but it might be called symptomatic if you fill in the questionnaire. So what's the advantage of lateral flow testing? Quick turnaround time, cheap, easy to use. I think the positive results are reliable. It's been already been used in millions. And in fact, in the NHS, we picked up in our hospital, for instance, a large number of people who were not ill enough to think, for them to think they want to go to test and trace, they're basically asymptomatic. And we are picking up positives who um, are clearly a danger to others. It's very popular, people like it, they take control of their status. And the surveys that we've looked at is most individuals understand perfectly well it's not a perfect test. And it does offer the promise of early quarantine release. Can I finish? Are you almost finished there? Yeah, this is really, this is newly finished. Okay. The, and the, um, so I think that the, we shouldn't compare it to PCR in a simple way. Um, the, I'll, go, I'll leave out the um, behavioral stuff because there are other talks on that. And so I think that it's useful for detecting positives. And interestingly, if you do daily contact tracing, which is the current research to enable people to um, go back to work during their 10-day their, their quarantine period, we think if you do that, it will encourage more people to be tested. And, they, and we think that the extra people you find will counterweight the possible leakage into, um, of negatives into the community. Okay. Thank okay. you, Tim. I'm going to pass on now to our final discussant, um, Patrick. I'm sorry, I've cut you a little short of time. Yes, uh, thank you very much for the invitation. In the interest of time, actually, I will not share any slides. But I'd just like to emphasize one point, and that is to go back to something that Phil said at the beginning. Phil said, we don't have tests for infectiousness. In fact, that's not entirely true. We have a range of tests, actually, to be used in COVID and SARS-CoV-2. The only thing is we don't know how good they are actually for evaluating infectiousness because we lack a clinical reference standard. And that's an agreed upon method to classify individuals as being infectious or not. And actually that's the main point, the most actually the known unknown in this whole discussion about do we have the right tools? I think we have a range of tools. The question is we don't know yet how good they are and that makes decision-making difficult. And with that, I'd like to give back uh, to the chair. Thank you so much. Uh, Nikki, can we therefore take some questions from, uh, from our audience? Yes, of course. So the first one is, um, how do you think that lower sensitivity can be compensated by quick turnaround and cheapness so that we could do LFD repeatedly, which is difficult to do with PCR? Oh, sorry, I think I've just read a question out from the wrong section no no that that is we moved that one down sorry, <laughs> sorry is, that, is that the right question fee fine question yeah perfect tim since i cut you off would you like to take that first well i think i mean the lower sensitivity issue is a question of what you mean i'm saying that they're 85 percent that you're missing 10 to 15 percent of the infectious one that's what we claim so we don't miss very many we claim and therefore if you double the number of people you test double the number of positives you get then that is profit. And the model is saying 
that an inefficient test but done more numbers will give you will do better than a very efficient test if you only do on a, on a small number of people. And I'm sure John's got a bit of a rejoinder to that. So, I mean, when we're talking about um, sensitivity, we're seeing a lot of discussion as to sensitivity against what reference standard, as, as Patrick was just saying. Uh, and so there's a lot of uh, suggestion that we should only be looking at defining people who've got CT values less than 25 or less than 30 or uh, some viral load as being the people who are diseased. So that there's a lot of uh, discussion and debate about that, a lot of which is very, very heated. Um, what we're seeing from the data I showed is that the basis for those assumptions, those cutoffs, is not really very sound, and that we actually need to be a little bit more thoughtful for that. Now, uh, lateral flow tests are, you know, any point of care test like that, it can be used far more accessibly. We can test far more people. And if we can get results back quickly, uh, more people in total might be able to, uh, to isolate than would do if we used a, a, a laboratory-based, more expensive, less accessible test. So in terms of the net uh, gain for the population, even using a test which doesn't get the proportions right, um, might end up with more people being isolated and more virus um, being prevented being spread. But Thanks. what I'm saying is we need better tests. We need to be out there looking for those more sensitive tests. We shouldn't be happy with what we've got by a long way. We are. We, we're looking. Okay, so we're we're going to let the audience have another question. Nikki, one more. Sure. Sure. Okay. If there are more sensitive tests, then why did DHSC purchase and deploy the ANOVA test? Well, all I can say is I, I've, got no, I've got no um, axe to grind. I've got no money on this. ANOVA was the first company which passed our screen, which gave us the kits to look at. There was nothing, there was no competition. No, nobody else gave us the kits to look at. Thank Can you. I just comment as well that we haven't been looking at all of the evidence from all of the countries. So the Foundation for Innovative Diagnostics has done a lot of other assessments John, we have of different all, tests. We have looked at all the lateral flow tests available. We looked very hard. So we're not, there's no, the idea that this is a, um, not an open study is a, not true. We're academics. I'm not, I've got no interest in anything else. Patrick, do you have anything on that issue? No. Then I will hand the chair back uh, and let you get on with the introducing the next session. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks. That's fascinating, wasn't it? It was all just on the poor verge of kicking off there. I've actually changed my mind, I think, about lateral flow tests. I was a bit sniffy about them until I heard that. Um, I think the distinction between symptomatic and asymptomatic, it's interesting. I used to work in sexual health where you can assume if you have a sexually transmitted infection, you'll think you'll have symptoms, but the commonest symptom is no symptoms. And then very commonly people would have florid symptoms and would be what we would call genitally unaware. So they could have the biggest symptoms in the world and not realize they had them. Um, so I think it's a really interesting distinction between what is symptomatic and what is asymptomatic. Uh, but Tim has slightly shifted me towards lateral flow tests. So thank you very much for that. Uh, we're now going to be talking about uh, communicating the test. This is clearly important. There are lots of nuances here. How do you communicate and act on the results of tests in very little time in NHS clinics when you're hiding behind a mask? All that very, very difficult. Uh, and we've got the right person to chair this session. So I'm going to hand over now the rather wonderful Alison Pollock. Over to you, Alison. Thank you, Phil. Well, um, we've heard from Angela the importance of thinking of testing as a programme. And so we're back to human beings, away from tests to humans and how they respond to tests and interventions. And so I'm delighted that we've got Theresa Marteau to cover the behavioral responses to the negative test, which have been alluded to. So I will start right away with Theresa. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alison. Just to be clear, I'm talking about just one of the many sets of behaviours that are key to uh, mass asymptomatic testing we've been talking about being effective in reducing transmission. Should we be worried about the potential for false reassurance following test negative results on mass testing? Theresa, you're on mute. That was why it wasn't working. Thanks, thanks, V. Did you did you hear the mic? Did it just go to mute? Yes. 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 Okay, good. Um, so what I want to do is uh, to address 
four questions. Um, and uh, we're entering into what I would call a data desert. Uh, so this shouldn't take too long. Does receipt of a test negative result decrease behaviors that can reduce transmission? Um, so social distancing, wearing face coverings, hand hygiene, and also uh, might it reduce the likelihood that somebody given a test negative result would go for testing uh, and, and be able to recognize symptoms of infection? What might be the nature and scale of any such decrease in these behaviors and how might that any decrease be mitigated? And finally, to think about some of the behavioral responses of those who haven't undergone testing, but are in the ecosystem of mass asymptomatic testing programs. Um, we've already talked about Liverpool, uh, and I call it an uncontrolled observational study, incredibly rich data. And as part of that, people completed surveys and these are just showing the data from that report of those who had tested negative. And they were asked whether they changed their behavior as a result of that. And you can see that around 62% said that they hadn't changed their behavior at all. Uh, around 22% said they'd gone for a walk or exercise. Uh, 20, no, uh, 19 had uh, gone to the shops and around 9% had gone to visit friends or family. This is a single cohort study, so there's no comparison group. This is based on self-report and importantly, a questionnaire response rate of under 7%. And you can see from the report, uh, they concluded no firm conclusions can be drawn, uh, but they felt there were no alarming indicators in those results. We don't have case reports. We have what I would call anecdotal reports, the first in the Liverpool Echo, a fine journal, uh, which reported an outbreak in a car plant uh, in Liverpool uh, where mass testing was being offered to the workers. Um, I'm not aware of a formal analysis of that outbreak. So it's possible it's chance. It's possible it may be because uh, people were behaving in a way that resulted in riskier behavior, feeling rather complacent because there was mass testing, um, or the employers might have um, uh, um, slipped in terms of the safety procedures in place. We don't know. Um, another report in The Guardian of uh, two people working in a hospital who'd recently undergone an Innova test, continued, and uh, they tested negative, continued to work on a ward, and uh, patients uh, then contracted the virus. What we don't know is about the ward where people were working who hadn't undergone those tests. Um, this isn't the first time that anybody uh, has taken part in a testing or a screening program and received test negative results. Um, every, every year, um, hundreds of thousands, millions of people undergo uh, take part in screening programs and the majority of them will get a screen negative result. And it's very thin pickings from the literature. I could only find one systematic review. It's a narrative analysis. And you can see on the left-hand side, it was nine RCTs that were found and evidence at high risk of bias. Um, so there didn't seem to be any signal of false reassurance from behavior, but actually these are very, um, uh, as I say, data at, uh, at high risk of bias. Um, so what I would uh, answer my questions from the limited evidence I can see is that probably receipt of a test negative result does decrease behaviors that uh, reduce transmission. Um, but importantly, we don't know uh, the precise nature or the scale of that. Um, assuming that some of this goes on, it then becomes uh, important to think about how such a decrease might be mitigated. And just one area that people have considered is the communication of the testing and what the results mean. At the moment, um, I, I believe I'm correct, that uh, NHS Test and Trace are reporting test negative results from lateral, lateral flow tests uh, with the wording in this blue box. Um, and as you can see, there's a, there's a verbal uh, expression of uncertainty. So your coronavirus test result is negative. It's likely you were not infectious when the test was done. 
we don't know how effective, well, I don't know how effective that message is. I haven't seen any evaluations of it. I don't know whether other verbal descriptors of uncertainty uh, or precision could be added to make it more effective. Similarly, I don't know whether or not an infographic, um, and there's a sample on the right-hand side that some of us are working on a, as a, a prelude to trying to evaluate this in online experiments, whether that would increase uh, understanding of the residual risk inherent in a test negative result. So uh, we, we don't know uh, whether or not any of these effects uh, might be mitigated. Um, and we don't know whether or not we could increase the proportion as yet unknown who correctly understand uh, what a test negative result on lateral flow means. I've been talking about those who have undergone the test, but I think it's an interesting question to think about those who haven't been tested. You've got a few seconds left now. Uh, thank you. Um, this is my final slide. Um, and uh, it, it, so thinking about uh, work, work site testing, um, it may be that some of the people who haven't undergone testing may have a superior sense of safety because they may well believe that a lot of those who are infected have been removed from the workplace. We also don't know how employers who um, have uh, invited in workplace testing might be responding, whether some of their safety measures might be relaxed somewhat. So all of these questions can be addressed in studies that are designed to infer causality, uh, arguably experimental, but that's not the only design we can use, and that can detect plausible effect sizes and use valid outcome measures of behavior. Thanks very much. Thank you, Teresa. Um, given the 22 billion pounds spent so far, it seems extraordinary that we haven't got the studies and evaluations to know how people respond to tests, especially with mass testing now, 100 billion pounds being planned for the spend. But straight over now, thanks so much, Lisa, so lovely and clear. Um, straight now to Jackie Castle, who's going to talk um, about what people do when they get the test result, the effectiveness of the interventions and how important that is. Thanks, Jackie. Thank you very much, Alison. Um, so uh, my only disclosure is that I serve on the social care working group that advises SAGE and I work at Brighton and Sussex Medical School. Um, so there was a time and there will soon be a time when this picture would not have been an object of horror to most of us. Um, it's coming again soon and um, vaccination is going to be a real game changer. So what I would like to explore is I'd like to set out the purpose of test, trace, isolate in all its purposes, but particularly thinking about asymptomatic and workplace testing. What is the intervention? How is it currently used? I then want to think about how its nature, purpose and impact is changed when we reach the UK aspiration of vaccination rollout to all over 50s and clinically vulnerable and highlight the implications of those changes for the um, public health, particularly the next phase of tra test, trace, isolate, which um, is going to be the subject of the next session. So what will the early vaccination era look like in the UK? Probably quite similar to Israel, where they quickly saw a reduction in hospital admissions in those who had, had um, worked not in the, in the vaccination age group, but not in others. And indeed, indeed, if you look at the newspapers in Israel, they've already announced that a week after your second vaccination, you will be exempt from quarantine. So back to sexual health, which is where Nicola, Phil and I come from. We think all the time about contacts and in sexual health, we have a very good contract uh, understanding of the range of numbers of contacts per um, year, day or lifetime indeed. For respiratory contact, which is predominantly what we see for COVID, work, housing, social distancing, distancing caring, hygiene behaviours, we have less of a sense of what, how many contacts people have a day and importantly, how and why that varies. However, if you look here, I compare Swale and Worthing, which at the beginning of December had the lowest and the highest, Swale the highest, um, numbers of um, COVID new cases. And Swale was somebody where you saw a very early rapid trajectory and Worthing was someone that reached that rather later. So if you look at the proportion of the population who provide over 50 hours of unpaid care per week, much higher in Swale, fewer one person households at every age, 
far more people in terraced houses, far more people with dependent children, very few spare bedrooms by comparison, more temporary housing, and more people who did the kind of work where they have to leave the home. So these are systematic differences in the, in the economy, which drive the numbers of unavoidable contacts people will have, but there aren't good contact data, so we have to infer it from this. So what's test and trace currently for, thinking particularly about asymptomatics? Well, it's for everything, it's everyone, isn't it? Um, and we're trying to reduce transmission and we're trying to massively reduce hospitalization, deaths, outbreaks in care homes and other vulnerable settings and get the health service going in and perhaps reduce long COVID, but we're not quite sure how much yet. Post-vaccination, we will be looking at everyone not considered highly protected by vaccine. Essential workers, children, international visitors, and people who don't want to have a vaccine for whatever reason. We want to reduce transmission, but importantly, the balance will have changed. There'll be very little hospitalization to present, prevent, few deaths, few outbreaks in care homes, which are now very well protected, um, as lo looking forward to, to uh, at vaccine coverage in these residents. And health service capacity will have got back to normal and there will be some long COVID to prevent, but you know, it doesn't look quite the same. So what are we really going to see? Just to summarise, we will see a growing concentration of all remaining cases and transmissions in younger workers and in children and students. This means we will see ongoing and recurrent requests to isolate for many, particularly parents, children and young people, people who can't work from home, and places who are systematically more like Swale than Worthing, who've already had far more school closures and far more isolation already. And then therefore there will be a change in the motivation and trade-offs by individuals and policymakers. Hospitalisation and deaths will be low. NHS functioning will be fairly normal, although clearly there's a huge backlog. Many vaccinated individuals will be leading relatively unrestricted lives, and there will therefore be a shift, which we don't yet understand, as Teresa said, in the motives and the beliefs of still who, people who are still and often recurrently asked to comply with test, trace and isolate. And if you listen to our um, leaders and our scientific and political leaders, we're already hearing requests that people test, take, test, trace and isolate to reduce the emergence of new variants, to reduce the spread of new variants, to protect vaccines. Now, that's a very different ask from what's going on at the moment. And that is how it's inevitably going to play out. So really... I'll stop here for the next section. What changes and choices will we make about test, trace and isolate and the burden of people on, and on whom that burden falls and on what evidence? Thank you very much. Thank you, Jackie. Um, gosh, it gets more and more complex, doesn't it? Um, many of the questions that we've just been asked in this section are around um, the unknowns, actually. Um, that's the problem about, you know, adherence to self-isolation, etc. But uh, Nikki, is there anything here that's coming up um, for you that we think we should ask Teresa and Jackie before we move on? Yeah, of course. The, 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 the top question is, is test, trace and isolate only feasible at an early stage where there's low incidence? I think in terms of can you deliver it sensitively, helpfully, um, and in a reasonably um, organised way, clearly with the numbers of cases we've got at the moment, it, it's really difficult. But I think, I mean, you know, all the points that were made earlier about the need to, to be really clear about what's symptomatic, asymptomatic, um, that needs to be done. But I think more than anything, I mean, clearly the scale of people feeling they cannot even test because they cannot afford to isolate, that is something that is an issue at whatever scale and we need to think about that as that goes on for some people and not for others. Thank you. Um, I, I'm going to ask you a very quick question. Oh, sorry, Alison. Oh, sorry, no. We should move on. Teresa, yes, yes. I, sorry, Please I, do say could, Teresa. I, could I just comment on what Jackie said and could I answer a question that you sent me earlier that you'd received about where people can find information about all the uh, pilots and testing evaluations that are going on. Um, so just first to uh, pick up on what Jackie has said, 
about this remains, uh, for me anyway, one of the key pieces of evidence that we've had that's been highlighted through SAGE and many other people, and Jackie's just mentioned it as well, about uh, still not having effective support packages so for people to self-isolate and the support needs to be financial, practical, social and clinical. And until we have that in place, um, uh, I, I, well, um, we're going to have loads of virus and even more virus uh, in the community. And the question that was asked in terms that, that you sent to me about where people might be able to find information about what pilots or evaluations are going on at the moment. Um, just to say that uh, on the various committees that I sit, I ask why we can't uh, pre-register protocols. And there's a slippery uh, uh, category between pilots and evaluation, service evaluations, research. So for the time being, I, that normal science is not practiced in these evaluations. And Tim Pito spoke about uh, why that might be. We're not in normal times. But my colleagues in DHSC say that uh, one uh, can ask DHSC, they are the ones who are overseeing all these programs, what programs are underway. Otherwise, uh, one has to file an FOI request. At the moment, they are not in one place open for all of us to see. Thank you. Thank you. Now that's a, a very good um, note to end this panel. Um, a call for not using the pandemic as an excuse for bypassing normal scientific processes and standards for developing and evaluating programs and studies. That's a really important point. So great note to end. And I'm going to hand over now to Fee, who's chairing the next session, or rather back to Phil to introduce Fee. Thank oh, you. Well, yes, thank, thank you, you. Uh, Alison. I will introduce Fee. Jackie made me think, I, I wish Julian Tudor Hart was still here. There are so many inverse COVID laws we could come up with. Those who most need to isolate can least afford to do so, find it hardest to do so. Those most harmed by COVID are also those most harmed by lockdown. There are so many double whammies. I've had my NHS COVID app on all the time, never been pinged once. I asked my delivery driver the other day, said I've been pinged six times. It is quite extraordinary how disproportionate uh, the COVID harm and the non-COVID harm has settled on the poor, but we knew that already. Uh, so yes, come up with your own inverse COVID laws. Maybe we can publish a whole load of them in the BMJ sometime. Our final session is indeed being led by Fiona. It's on testing in different settings and contexts. Over to you, Fiona. Thank you very much, Phil. I mean, my just uh, follow on from that is is exactly the inverse care law and, and this this tendency of government to blame the public when, in fact, you know, the idea that none of the people in government can imagine not having a spare bedroom and three bathrooms and uh, all the money they need to, to take time off from work. So I, I think that the business of support for self-isolation, as true as you've just said, is so crucial and it's just criminal that it isn't happening. Uh, that's what gets me shouting at the television of an evening. So thank you so much. We have a session now about uh, set testing in different settings. We've got three speakers, one first about workplace, then about prisons, and then about in the community. I'm delighted to have Pete Buckle with us, who's Principal Research Fellow in Vitro Diagnostics at National Institutes for Health Research. Over to you, Pete. Thank you very much, Fiona. Um, can everyone see the screen? Um, so what do I want to tell you today? I've listened uh, with a great degree of fascination to what's gone before. And I have spent the last year um, based at within the Department of Medicine at Imperial College, but helping a group called Condor do a national evaluation of point of care tests, not on the whole lateral flow test, but other tests. Um, and I also sit on the government's workplace health expert committee. And these things are relevant because we have a situation at the moment where employers across the country are keen to be using tests to make their workplaces safer. What does that mean? Well, it means that they want to, as it were, try and reduce the hazard that they have, which is encroaching into their workplace. But you will realize from the discussion that's gone on, on over the last hour and a half that this is a very complex thing for anyone to get their head around, let alone a small medium enterprise or some other organization. 
Um, they can't eliminate um, what's happening. Um, they can't substitute it. They do a certain amount of isolation anyway, but the only way to really isolate is not to have people in a place of work. They can introduce some engineering controls, which might be the kind of screens that you see put up in buildings. But it's down here at the administrative controls where testing fits in. Below that, you might have PPE, uh, personal protective equipment and so on. So testing is only one part of a whole set of risk control measures. And when we start to look at the tests that are available, it is inevitable that very quickly we get to look at lateral flow tests versus perhaps, as some questions were raised earlier, about other tests that are out there that are probably have higher degrees of sensitivity and specificity. Uh, I don't know how to, all right, okay. And we've seen from the presentations from Tim and also the discussion with John that um, false negatives um, are a topic of hot conversation, as I believe false positives should be too, and I'll tell you why in a moment. Both of them have the potential to uh, damage and cause damage in work and to workplaces and to organisations. So we need to really see it in terms of through through that lens, shall I say. Um, Tim's talked about how at his hospital, um, he feels that uh, routine testing of staff, presumably with lateral flow tests, has been beneficial. But I can tell you that when I talk to colleagues at St Mary's Hospital, where I'm based, when I talk to people around other clinicians around the country, that actually compliance with testing is really not very good because basically it's quite an unpleasant thing to do. There's self-testing very often. You're supposed to do it twice a week. And actually the compliance isn't that great. So when we start to look at the motivation for people to test themselves, when we look at the compliance with the um, routines, regimes, if you like, that are out there, we realize that very quickly they don't work terribly well. And I'm just going to give you some anecdotal data at the moment, although it will be written up very shortly. We've been looking at quite a lot of care homes across the country and evaluating tests in quite a lot of uh, 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 locations. And some of the anecdotal evidence that we're getting back is really quite, quite worrying. Um, a series of care homes that we've looked at that implemented the government uh, guidance on PCR and lateral flow testing twice a week, well, PCR and lateral flow once, and then a second lateral flow um, over Christmas and into the new year, we've followed them. And at least half of the homes, more than half of the homes we've looked at have subsequently still had an outbreak of um, COVID. And COVID in a care home, you will imagine, is very, very serious. So one case can lead to many others. We know of cases where um, at least half the care home staff have been also tested positive and over half the residents as well. Now, I can't prove that it was a testing that let it down, but it certainly seems to me that it's quite a leaky system if we're going to rely on testing. So that's one example. And another example, which um, I think is where we get into what it, what does the real world of testing look like rather than the laboratory validation. We can argue forever maybe about the relationship between viral load, uh, ability to test, and uh, ability to detect and infectiousness. But let us assume for a moment that lateral flow tests are quite good at pick picking up those with high viral loads. I can tell you that last week I was talking with care home managers who think it's fine to have their staff coming in, they queue up on the staircase outside, they come in and they're tested, and if they're negative, so be it. Well, the truth is you're now inviting people with potentially high viral loads into your care home setting, uh, which is the last thing you want. So the reality of what's going is very going on is, is, is really quite complex. And we also realize that in these cases, when it appears to either the employees or the employer that the testing didn't work and didn't act as the barrier that they thought it was, then there's a potential for damage in faith in testing programs, not just for this, but other public health testing programs as well. And we're really quite concerned about the wider implications of a system where, let us be honest, the public think that it's either a positive or a negative test, you've either got it or you haven't. So I think the, the real world implementation of these things really does need to be thought about very carefully. So just down at the bottom here. need to move on. Yes, I will. And I'll, I'll, I'll stop with this then, Fiona, thank you. Just down at the bottom here, I think we have something which we really have to get over. I think there are many 
that think they know what testing is going to do. That's testing as imagined. We then see something prescribed, which is what the government has done, which is testing as prescribed. We then sometimes hear back what people thought happened, which is some of our, our, our national um, reporting systems. But what we have to find out is what is actually happening in the workplace. Testing is done, and that's what we spend our life doing. And when we do that, we see a very, very different picture and a much more complex one about whether or not these testing strategies are really going to be useful and implemented in the real world. Thank you. Pete, thank you so much. Wonderful. I'm moving swiftly on, if we may, to Andrew Fraser, who's going to tell us about prisons. Andrew is former deputy, former deputy CMO in Scotland and Director of Public Health Science at NHS Scotland with responsibility for prisons. Over to you, Andrew. Hello, thank you. Um, and I should add, I, after being DCMO, I went to the prisons and worked there for some time. And I, I'm back advising them now. I'm listening very carefully to the uh, many presentations which are fascinating um, and trying to apply this to uh, a practical problem with prisons. Um, first, a number of words of explanation. Prison is a special setting. There's 85,000 souls in there who live there. But as Pete Buckle has uh, just pointed out, it's a workplace too. And uh, a number of the points he made are very salient uh, to prisons from the staff perspective. We've got a vulnerable population. Uh, the de demography is young, but there are many uh, and increasing numbers of older people there, uh, many with comorbidities, physical problems, mental problems, uh, addiction problems. Uh, th they are very highly represented in this population. The state is a special duty of care um, because they are um, that the prisoners um, didn't choose to be there. The state has decided what criminality is and the courts have assigned them to that setting. So they're not there necessarily for the good of their health. Um, and um, reflecting on what Jackie Castle had to say, um, I think the, the risk will persist in being high, uh, partly because we have youngsters and comorbidities and vulnerabilities. So that's the context. But the reason for people uh, being where they are um, really guides what happens next. Now, a prisoner comes in to a prison. Um, they've been battering around the community, a police cell, uh, the back of a van, maybe court. So when they come in for the first two weeks, we assume they are at risk of infection or infect themselves. So in Tim, Peter, Tim Peter's uh, terms, there is guilt by association. And so we make an assumption that they might be infected or they might be at risk of infection. So the question there is, what would testing add to uh, the management of uh, prisoners in that first two weeks? And assuming they're not infected and uh, the uh, tests aren't positive because they are tested there, they move on to a phase of prison, which is like a residential institution with low turnover of uh, prisoners. But the main risk from then on is from the staff. Uh, the staff to each other, but the staff who are much more mobile than the prisoners from then on. So what do we do about testing um, a, a, a cohort of prisoners in a very large bubble who we hope are not infected? Uh, and my attention turns to the staff at that point, because that is where the risk come from. Uh, and that is maybe uh, where we need to spend uh, more time um, thinking about the risks and the appropriate tests. So ultimately, in testing in the prison setting, we need to decide what the purpose is, the clear purpose back to the, the very start of the, uh, the webinar, um, to ask the question, what are you going to do differently for a given type of test, for testing negative or testing positive? Because I also think they both are salient. What is the support package? Theresa Marto's point. Uh, in prison. It's a very different nature of support package, but there are incentives and disincentives to uh, knowing that you're positive or negative, but mainly uh, drawbacks because you go from a very poor regime because it's much poorer at the moment um, in its quality and it gets even poorer if you are uh, needing to be further isolated. All this needs evaluation. Uh, it needs the research community to help us. But ultimately, we look at at other settings for equivalence. And oddly enough, 
for the long-term prisoners, probably the arrival of international travelers and the way they're going to be treated might be the closest equivalent. Whereas, um, uh, sorry, that's for the, for the newly arrived prisoner. For the longer term prisoner, the care home setting still uh, provides some equivalence, but by no means all. And anyway, I'll leave you these reflections and I hope that adds to the discussion. Thank you. That's a brilliant analogy. Um, airline passengers for the immediate arrivals and uh, care, home passengers, care home residents for the long-term prisoners. Thank you very much, Andrew. Uh, moving on then, Stefan Boral is here to tell us about community, testing the community setting. And Stefan is Associate Professor at Johns Hopkins University. Stefan. Yeah, thanks very much. Thanks for the opportunity. I, I should note, uh, I'm a, an investigator on several grants, but draw no personal salary from those. So I'll just say, I mean, you know, actually my, my most hands-on experience uh, in terms of COVID-19 has been managing um, the, the prevention and, and, and outbreaks within homeless shelters in Toronto. And so I'll note, you know, when the outbreak first started or the epidemic first started, we really, we activated our population health team and we laid out criteria for testing within shelter settings, because I think similar to uh, Dr. Frazier, um, there's a lot of similarities in terms of, of the community and the setting within shelters and, and jails. Um, but our, our policies were and, and ideas were really based on, on Wilson and Jugner, which I think many of the themes that we've heard today are, are as well. And that was that a testing program should integrate education and clinical services and program management. It should be based in equity and, and ensure broad access to screening and that we should have an evaluation built into it. And when we were thinking initially, we didn't know a lot about outpatient based treatments. I'll note that anybody obviously sick enough was, was going to be admitted to hospital. We were really managing folks in, uh, who, who didn't require outpatients, uh, who didn't require it. And I'll note that we sort of thought of like four different reasons why we would be doing that. So one obviously is screening. Secondly is for diagnostic purposes. Third is for the purposes of public health in terms of limiting uh, the spread of outbreaks. And fourth is just the collection of data. It became pretty clear in, initially that we didn't really have much of an intervention to offer folks in the outpatient setting. And so other than oxygen saturation monitors, just to ensure that they weren't actually sicker than they thought they were, there really was very limited things that we had to offer them. Similarly, um, from a screening perspective, um, we, you know, we gave thought to what we could do and we had, you know, I think similar to other places set up isolation sites, et cetera. Um, but really the focus was all of the, you know, the, the goal of both the sort of, um, the testing that we were doing, especially for asymptomatic folks within shelters as well as in the community, is really this idea of like, what are we offering folks that are really gonna interrupt onward transmission? And uh, I, I just sort of wanna share just two quick anecdotes. One of them is that um, while we were only able to offer into our isolation sites, uh, spaces for people who were logged into our uh, shelters before the pandemic started, about 80% of the calls, literally 40, 50 calls a day, were really from folks who were not able to isolate in their homes. And we offered them nothing. Um, we gave them advice of where to isolate, and we knew that we were sending them back into a place where they couldn't isolate and really expose everybody in that household. So I think that was one fundamental thing. Um, secondly, is really a, you know, an insight that I've had from now managing, um, you know, at this point, having been involved with or led dozens of outbreaks, uh, uh, outbreak responses. Um, and, and so one of them is, is that the initial uh, case is always a staff member who is on the margins. We even have staff members who are residing in other shelters. Um, and, and I'll note this is in Canada. Uh, and so the fundamental issues that we've heard about today about making it easy to not go to work when they're sick, it remains fundamental and has been the source of many of our outbreaks, including outbreaks that have caused people to die. I don't blame any of those folks who went to work that day, I, I think that their decision-making process is far more complicated than anything we could ever imagine. And, 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 and we have to appreciate that. The second thing that we've had to do often that I've seen in the models as it relates to the use of testing within facility-based outbreaks is like, what is the counterfactual? And I'll note, and we've heard this today, that the turnaround time for some of the testing is such that we have to act before we have the test results which is very traditional outbreak management. I know there's a lot of public health specialists on this call. We have to respond in the way that we did before we had tests to react to. And we do that. We do contact investigations, very broad symptom assessments, as we heard from Dr. Lowe, Professor Lowe about very broad assessments because people present in, 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 
in very uh, different and, and unique ways. And we manage those contacts and, and have them go to isolation before we have the test results. And we do very intense um, management, especially in those sort of first five days when we feel like that initial case is really going to manifest in a large scale outbreak or not. And so I think I, I worry a little bit when I see mathematical models that lay out, you know, a testing based strategy versus a we don't do anything strategy, because in reality, all of us who are public health specialists are actively managing outbreaks, whether those being facilities and whether those being workplaces, whether those being jails. Uh, and I think it needs to be integrated into the process and so that we can understand, you know, the, the derivative or additional values that, that testing provide us. So, I, I, you know, I, I really, we don't have a lot of time today, but I, I do want to say that, um, you know, I find it uh, unethical to offer people testing without offering them an intervention in response. I find it unethical to blame individuals for the sorts of decisions that I hope to never be in a place to have to make in terms of, of risking not being able to feed my family versus not going to work. And so I think that, you know, as we start, and I think we've heard those themes throughout today, as we start thinking about what does a meaningful response look like? It is one that is empiric and is equitable and is responsive to the risks that we've identified, um, which is to say very concentrated. Uh, and I'd almost feel like at this point, we can say that COVID is a disease of poverty and is a disease of inequitable systems and structural racism. And I think it now needs to become more central to the response strategy. Thanks very much. Thank you so much, Stefan. I, I couldn't possibly say that better. And, and you've, you've absolutely made a crucial point there on which I will hand back to Phil. Oh, thank you, Fiona. Yeah, I'd really like that point, Stefan, is that you shouldn't ethically, you shouldn't offer a test unless you're accompanying it with an intervention that allows the person to comply with that. That's really, I mean, that, would, that nails it, actually. That's a fascinating insight. Thank you. I remember when George first asked me to do these, so I was struggling a bit in private eye. I didn't know really who to talk to. And so I spoke to George and George says, there is no one single pandemic expert. What you need to do is to get a whole load of different opinions and expertise uh, from people who understand science and work collaboratively together and try and weave it all together. And I've had a real sense of that today. Sadly, hundreds of questions and we won't be able to answer them all, but I hope we'll publish the questions somewhere and some people may be able to answer them uh, off uh, this webinar. But let's get on to Nikki now and you may have a suggestion of who the question goes for. Where are you, Nikki? I'm here, perfect. Um, so our first question, I think this might be for Teresa. Um, oh. but what does the evidence show on the number of asymptomatic people who adhere to self-isolation, distancing and mask rules currently without a COVID test result and how this changes if they are given a negative test result? Do they still comply by the same rules? So just to clarify, you so say the question is, if somebody has tested negative and then they test positive, uh, what is their response to a request to self-isolate? I think the, the question's more sort of, do people still adhere to the rules um, if they know they've tested negative? Uh, well, that was what my presentation, I think, was focused on. Um, and uh, we don't know, so some people, uh, will uh, 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 decrease behaviours that uh, reduce transmission, but we don't know the nature and the scale of that, sadly, which is why we need um, to build in some evaluations into the large scale studies that are underway. And um, I'm hoping to uh, probably team up with uh, Pete Buckle and uh, others to start looking at this on a broader scale. That is a recurrent theme of all these webinars is we need to do proper research. A surgical mask better than homemade cloth masks. There are all sorts of questions we should be asking and we need to do the research. It'll be interesting to see how people's behavior changes after one jab. Do they leave it two or three weeks and then go out, ditch the masks, carry on as normal? We shall see, interesting times. Uh, Nikki, who else have you got for us? Um, so another question that we've got is, where does this leave the mass asymptomatic testing and screening in schools? Oh, who wants to pick that one up? Who would like to talk about asymptomatic screening in schools? Well, can I answer that? Um, yeah. we're just, there's a study which we are organising, might start soon, which is actually um, investigating that properly about mass screening with or without um, daily contact tracing and release. So half the schools will go in one arm, half the other arm with a behavioural element which Theresa's involved in and trying to work out what the leakage is and what the total um, behaviour is and how many transmissions there are has been planned, whether it will happen, that's the, that's the current plan. 
but you are the PI, Tim, just to on PI. that. Uh, it's, it's called, uh, I'm, I'm not an investigator, but I'm uh, part of a board advising. Uh, so it's called a pragmatic cluster RCT. And I understand that that is one of the first uh, protocols for mass testing that will be pre-registered, will go to an ethics committee. So uh, this is um, the beginning. It's meant to be like a clinical trial, that's the idea. Can I, can I respond on that as well? I mean, I think one of the really important things to consider in any trial of schools is the impacts across the family, both the impacts on children of being kicked out, not kicked out, but also the parents being able to go work to work, not go to work, and the household generation, household stuff, and the fact that many com households are complex. And so I think it's really, given the limited, surprisingly limited role of children in transmission, we need to make sure we're taking a proper holistic and pragmatic view of, um, with all those things in mind. Thank you, Jackie. I work in paediatric chronic fatigue, and I had a webinar from one of our psychologists who said that post-traumatic stress is much higher in children when their perception of the world is unsafe. So if they're really frightened about what's going on, you're making them stick swabs up here and there. You know, I'm doing home consultations now almost entirely via video, and levels of anxiety already are through the roof. We're creating a whole nation of germophobic children who are petrified of COVID, and the new variant and the mutant on the loose is scaring them. In, so in that the, in the autumn, worries me about this testing is what it's going to do to them psychologically. In, in the autumn, we did three schools in the autumn on this, and it was the general feeling was the majority of children and parents and staff were very felt empowered and much happier and safer okay. than not. Thank you. What's that's a really good point. Thank you for sharing that, uh, Peter. Uh, Nikki, do we have another question? Yes, I think this one might be for Angela or Sean. Um, yeah. People are asking. If, if we, they can hear about something on screening and hospital inpatients, about how frequently, which modality, and if there are any special situations such as cancer patients and pretreatment. I'm going to say I don't know. Excellent. Thank you. I also say I don't know. I think we both sort of work in population screening, and this is, you know, very much high risk settings. I, I'm sorry to be answer again, but in we're doing screening of hospital patients using natural flow, we're doing PCR and natural flow, natural flow for a quick answer and PCR for confirmation or not. And then that allows us to see what the false, the mistake rates are, which is actually quite remarkably low, but that's a different story to be publishing. But that's, it, it, it's proved very popular to get some idea of whether low, apparently low risk people are in fact surprisingly positive. Thank you for that. Uh, Nikki, another question? Sure. Um, so what do we know about viral load curve in symptomatic and asymptomatic people, given that much of the analytics work has been done on symptomatic people? Well, perhaps for Nicola, Tim or John? John, are you still there? Yeah, I'm here. The um, One of those studies I showed, the, the PHE study, had both symptomatic and asymptomatic people in it. And I've just read through it. And it says there was no difference between them. That's the level of detail I can uh, I can I can give on that. But um, the authors may have more information. Tim may know more. Yeah, I mean, the, we, at the moment, there isn't really much difference between symptomatic and asymptomatic. And that that's, it's a, I'm not certain that the difference is really worth getting excited about. I know it was, we called asymptomatic testing, but the differences are quite marginal. Okay. So maybe I could just add something to that, which is it depends on what the definition of asymptomatic is. And were those were those uh, people being tested who then subsequently developed symptoms, in which case they were simply pre-symptomatic and you would expect them to have quite high viral loads? Or were they people who had truly asymptomatic infection and were asymptomatic throughout? And then maybe that uh, um, allows you to interpret. I, I, I think I, I actually think the difference. I mean, I think these are, some of these people are truly asymptomatic, but it's the question of what you mean by symptomatic. I'm sorry, this is a subjective concept. Okay, so what you need is you need to be able to interpret it. You, you need a good definition of what symptoms they counted as symptomatic, okay. and you need a good definition of how long they followed them up to see whether they were asymptomatic or not. And without any of that information, I don't think you can say whether they were the same or different. Okay, thank you. Uh, Nikki? Time for one more, a few more? Yeah, but let's give one more. So what is what are the environmental impacts of the lateral flow test devices? 
Ooh. Plastic. <laughs> more than masks, more or less than masks, do we know? <laughs> <laughs> no. like we, we have been asked this question and we don't have very good answers to so it. The, buff, the buffer is basically salt water, completely safe, you can drink it. Yeah. Okay. We are aware though that in some settings there are biosafety issues around these things because of where they're transported. In a care home, for example, you have to be very careful where they're being used and so on. I don't know about the environmental cost and whether or not they, any of them are recyclable, for example. I, I expect not, but. Thank you. Uh, I think time is almost upon us. It's been fascinating. I, I come back actually to what uh, Tim said earlier about the countries that managed the pandemic well had to almost predict the science. The precautionary principle means you act ahead of the evidence before it arrives, you go in hard and fast, and then if you've then overreacted, you adjust as the evidence supplies. And I think we do need to cut policymakers a little bit of slack in that they're having to act very quickly. Uh, but that's then no excuse for not doing the evidence afterwards and changing our position. And, and that's what we need to. to encourage uh, and it's been absolutely fascinating such having such a broad range of not just opinion but from different contexts um, the Canadian context was really interesting as you know in prisons uh, and for homeless people what does it actually mean um, and it is largely COVID is largely uh, uh, affecting poorer people in poorer settings the inverse care law is still applying and so we make all these judgments but we need to remember that the impact it has on real lives so thank you all for joining us. Uh, George, do you want to come in and tell us what the next one is? Because I forgot what your next unknown unknowns um, thing is. This will available at the moment on the YouTube website the end day, and will obviously stay up and be available if you weren't able to catch it all. But thank you all for joining us. George, tell us what the next one is. Yeah, so uh, the next one in two weeks time is going to be on uh, vaccines. Ooh. And uh, the registration should uh, go out on Monday uh, with the programme. Uh, the programme includes Ben Goldacre ah. talking about uh, pharmacovigilance. When are we doing zero COVID? Are we doing that as well, George? We're doing zero COVID in a month. Oh, will we um, have zero COVID by then, do you think? Do you predict that? <laughs> uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> and what have you learned? What, what's changed your mind from this session, George? What have you changed your mind over? Lateral flow tests? Um, on, in, on, on this uh, session, yeah, I think... Uh, but well, I've, I, I think it's it's confirmed. Uh, I shouldn't say it's confirmed my views of things. The fact that we really, really should not int introduce um, introduce interventions without setting up some system for actually collecting data on whether they what they do. Um, you know, the, the, we've got to get ready for the next pandemic. We've got to get ready that we're, that we're all set to uh, start collecting the data as soon as possible and actually to. Um, allocating uh, interventions and ways which allow data to be collected. I think yeah. that there'll, there'll be discussion of that uh, in the webinar in, uh, in, in two weeks time. But my takeaway is Stefan's point that it's not ethical to offer somebody an intervention or offer somebody a test unless you're prepared to give them the intervention that allows them to comply with that test. I, that needs to be Absolutely. resourced as well. And I thought that was a brilliant point. Absolutely. And that's something that Jackie's and others have, and Muge and others have written about in the BMJ. That's uh, absolutely, absolutely crucial. Thank you all. Uh, and we'll see you at the next webinar. Thanks for joining in. Bye, everyone. Thanks to all the expert participants. It was fascinating. Bye, everyone.